Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon uh, in this uh, opportune uh, discussion with um, Si Muhammad Milehi, the artist, um, the <laughs> pioneer, the person who's influenced a lot of my own thinking, um, someone I really look up to, uh, and I am really feeling very honored that I have this moment with you on stage. Um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't go past me that this is for me a historic moment. Uh, and also, it is our, our absolute pleasure as the Department of Culture and Tourism and as part of Abu Dhabi Art to be hosting you here in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, it's something really that comes to us as a, on, as a great pleasure. Uh, si Muhammad Milehi is known for a multifaceted career um, in both uh, as a visual artist but also as a thinker uh, a writer, a publisher, um, an activist, and someone who's also taken official roles in institutions in Morocco. Um, this uh, conversation today will be, um, as much as possible, a free flow conversation, and we'll, uh, I'll be asking him questions uh, about his career and his outlook uh, across the years. Um, and I do want to say that uh, we, uh, within the UAE itself, will be seeing a lot uh, in the next year and in hopefully more to come and in institutions all over the world, the recognition that both he and his peers deserve. Uh, they have been instrumental in creating a modern language and landscape of art um, what is now renowned as the Casablanca Art School is really their uh, thinking, their rigorous uh, work to create uh, um, a, a language of visual arts, but also something that is uh, giving back to their own society from a perspective of arts. Um, there are multiple shows that are going to happen, I know that, um, and especially one that will open soon uh, for, uh, 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 on Mohamed Milehi's work and its relationship to the Casablanca School in Asirkal Avenue next month in Dubai. Uh, so there's a lot to look out to. Um, and this is uh, curated by Murad Muntazami and Zaman Books, and he's here also with us. Um, Si Muhammad, let's start with you and your... Yes, uh, um, I wanted to ask you initially to start to tell us about your beginnings yeah. in Asila. Thank, <coughs> thank you very much. But uh, first of all, and before everything, I would like to address my thanks to the Art Dubai for giving me the opportunity to be here and meet with you. Of course, my first thanks go to you, as now you are becoming my friend. Thank you for coming to attend this talk. My thanks go to Khadija, my wife, who is taking care a lot about me and helping me to carry on my artistic career in the better conditions, and she is here among you. And. Uh, my thanks goes to <coughs> Lori and Shabibi, who were the artisans to work on this trip for me to, to be here in front of you. And uh, my thanks go especially with a certain precaution because Reem is going to chop me tonight <laughs> with her questions. <laughs> Many thanks to her. And uh, also the, the famous artisan of all this business is Murad Montazami, who has curated my retrospective show that you will, be, you will have a chance to visit next March in Dubai. And other people whom I don't know who they are have contributed to bring me to Abu Dhabi this time. Thank you very much. And be patient if if I com commit a mistake or a, a, devi a deviation in the talk, and that's up to Reem to correct it. 
Thank no you deviations. Very much. Um, uh, as always, you're you're as generous as always and uh, as modest as always. Um, but uh, I know we had, you know, you'd always talked about your relationship to place. Um, uh, you sent me a really kind of valuable insight uh, about your position from living in the northern part of Morocco in Asila, uh, your hometown close to Tangier, uh, the relationships to uh, a really turbulent, uh, let's say, history that comes from, let's say, Europe and the First World, the Second World War, and uh, what does it mean, uh, these relationships, and how can we complicate that narrative, and what do you what is your place from within it, and how? What is your the place for you as an artist in relation to all of that? Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, as uh, all of us, we know that uh, our first childhood, we are dropped immediately into school. What is a school? It's a space. Speaking of school, like the almost hundred years ago, in a square space between walls, and uh, you start receiving education and information and language. But that position cuts you from the outside. And the outside of the school is the most important thing that marks your imagination and your life. Rem has mentioned this period of last World War II it was very important for us as a market where we could uh, find questions and sometimes uh, answer to those questions. The war is a war. It's violent. It's conflictual social situation, but at the same time brings in the into the market elements of knowledge. Speaking of Asila, if you allow me to position this little town, 30,000 people, in the northern part of Morocco, near to the Strait of Gibraltar. What that means, Strait of Gibraltar, is both sides door, door to Africa, and another door at the same time to Europe. So everything used to come across this, this position, plus uh, that period in the, s in the 30s, I was born in 1936, starting a war in Spain. Spain was ruling, ruling Morocco as a protector anyway. So uh, uh, as a Muslim, an Arab, and culturally speaking a Berber, and I wonder what, what do you know about Berber culture in Morocco and the North Africa. So we, we, we used to be, uh, how to see, bombarded by new figures. Uh, at that time, there were no, no TV, no internet, but our listening was more bright, and we, we catch everything. Anyway, Tangier was 40 kilometers far, far from my hometown, and they used to be taken to Tangier with my father for medical reasons of for his business, and Tangier used to be like Hong Kong, an international place where all the, the elements of the war existed, and they, it were in the bargain in this town. So Tangier was, the, for me, like a, uh, a window, uh, the window that a store makes to show the street, what's inside. So in Tangier, I saw lots of things, many things uh, that I didn't see in at school. Uh, of, course, of course, I, I saw what's Coca-Cola, for instance. For instance. What is this chewing gum? Anyway, I don't want to, to be late on this. The American influence start happening in that area of the world. Before this time, in Europe, and in North Africa. And North Africa was a very conflictual situation because we were under sort of colonization by France, by uh, Spain, 
even Tangier was on, in the eyes of United Kingdom to be taken like Gibraltar, so they can occupy the Strait of Gibraltar and so on. But my aim was at that time to become an artist. Why? Because the school where I was learning, I, I started learning Quran, then Arabic, then Spanish, but the foreign magazines, the cinema, we used to see almost every day a film because Azila is a little town with a uh, cinema house. They used to, to show almost every day one film. Can I use this? Okay. So, uh, why I'm t t talking about cinema? The cinema in the 30s and 40s wa was mostly uh, exposing Hollywood thinking and Hollywood look to the world. So, through the cinema, we ha I have seen so many things, many new things. And then, till in teenage, I saw a picture called An American in Paris. And the story about this American in Paris is an American painter who, during the last world war, remained in Paris and he's a paint painter. So I, I saw this picture. The actor was Gene Kelly, if you know about his name, and Leslie Caron, I think. And uh, a lot of artistic activity, lots of colors, and all the film was uh, photographed in, the, in Montmartre, yeah. where the painters are painting and showing their works on the easels. So that start building my dream to become one of this kind of person. How old were you when you saw that film? I was uh, 15 years old. 15, 16 years old, and that was my de decision to become like that that man I saw in the <laughs> in the screen of the cinema. And you didn't go to Paris; you went to Rome. No, I didn't go to Paris. First, firstly, I, I went to study in Spain after having two preparatory years in Morocco. Then I moved to Spain before our independence because of language facilities and because of a scholarship that I had to go to learn art in Spain in Sevilla first. First year in Sevilla, second year in, in Madrid. But uh, I knew about French art, Paris, the Impressionist, and those painters who were really in my imaginary is our Van Gogh, the Dutch painter, and Gauguin, mm -hmm. the conflictual <laughs> artists in history. These two artists, they used to, to, to tease each other and even to be nasty and <laughs> bad. That the point that uh, Van Gogh cut his ear to show Gauguin, this is one version, to show him how he was craving. He he was in love with uh, his girl at that time, and to prove her that he was really in love with her, he put his hand on the candle, you know, to burn his hand. So these things <laughs> that artists happen, you know, uh, left some ideas in my mind at that time. Anyway, uh, you said I didn't go to France. I. I avoided to go to France because Italy was to me, for me, the place to go. And I, I've done very well because Italy was more open, more uh, advanced in new forms of art than France. France is a heavy culture, a very heavy culture, a literary culture, and visually culture, France has resi resisted, as you may know, 
throughout modern history to movements like Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. The French never admitted that Bauhaus could be considered as an academic movement. They refused to listen to the futurist mm -hmm. during the, the last war also mm -hmm. because they were considered fascist and in connivance with the, the fascism in Italy anyway. Mm -hmm. And you had in France, a very important person who is André, André Breton. Mm -hmm. He's the frère of, the, the brother of Marcel Duchamp, if you might know. Mm -hmm. And he was defending mostly the, the movement of surrealism. So if you think about the mov Bauhaus movement and the futurists, they were more plastic artists, they were more rational artists, rational movement, they were more a language easy to understand by society. Those two movements participated in edu to educate society on basic things and on real things rather than surrealistic movement. I'm sorry to keep... No, I, I... You I should I stop me when you no, see no, that. No, no, this is very interesting because I know how much of an influence Bauhaus is to you. And I wanted to ask about where did this start? Where, where are, what are the beginnings of that influence? How were you exposed to it? And maybe we'll come later to kind of your trajectory. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> there are two things. Firstly, because to be influenced with a theory, mm -hmm. it stands on your uh, established way of thinking very intimate mm -hmm. and with some nationalistic connotations because Morocco, we were governed by France and Spain, so we're n we were not that much uh, sympathetic, sympathetic with these cultures. Either they are basic cultures for us, but we always try to search where, where, where else we can find more quiet instruction, more quiet education. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. Baos is a German movement, is a German who fled Germany because uh, the Nazi movement was after them because they were considered uh, extremist and against the, the system in Germany, so they fled to the United States, and that's the chance for the United States to build its artistic movement. And we are, we are really aware about this. So Hans Hoffman, one of the Bauhaus, has Moholy Nag. Hans Hoffman created the Black Mountain College in North Carolina, or South Carolina, I don't remember. And Moholy Nag was run the the Institute of Technology and Design in Chicago. So these two centers in the United States played a big role in the modern American art. Like Jackson Pollock is a student of Black Mountain College, mm -hmm. like Motherwell, like lots of them. If you are interested in the American art, you know you discover that Bauhaus has played with Arau for Morocco. What is the interest to be interested in Bauhaus in Morocco? Because as when I came back to my own country, now I jumped a little bit jumped history, little bit. <laughs> Spain, Italy, France, plans just passing by in France where I, I danced. And this uh, was the early 60s, right? In the early, 1960 precisely, I was at the fine art mm -hmm. of Paris, learning etching. While in Italy, I was studying sculpture. One of my professors was Pericle Fazzini, it's like Brancusi's mm -hmm. period, who I became his assistant at, at the class, by the way. Anyway, from France, I made this uh, journ uh, journey in United Kingdom, in London precisely, where I met Lawrence Alloway, who was the curator of the Guggenheim in a certain period in six. Anyway, all these were all elements who have enriched my mind, my knowledge. And the last jump was the, to go to the United, United States. Uh, 
in France, in England. So this baggage helped me to be introduced, you know, in milieus, in gatherings. Like, for instance, I happened to be, I cannot tell you how it came, but uh, I knew a curator at the Metropolitan, Metropolitan at that time, a very, always a very old man, so he, I met in his house during cocktails and dinners, artists like Glaze Oldenburg, Frank Stiller, art critic Henry Gilzaller. This Henry Gilzaller was a very important uh, art critic for the pop movement. And it happened to be that he was born in Tangier. So there are things that link you, operate like a link from people, where they are born, who they know. So one day, uh, a young curator, Ken Pelwali, came to visit my studio, and he saw a painting, tight, which I put the title IBM, a style of between Rothko and Mondrian, this defined square, and he said, I would like to show you work at the MoMA with the, in, the, in the exhibition titled The Hard Age and Geometric Painting. That was my first step. Then I was... What year was that? That was 1962, 63. Then through Will Barnett, who was an artist of Bertha Schaefer Gallery at that time, it used to be a very important gallery, and the most in advanced gallery for abstract art, because abstract art took time to be admitted and accepted in the United States. You should, you should know that. Yes. So s this lady liked my work till the point he said, OK, you are Mohammed. Your name is very hard to put in the market. Why don't you change your name? <laughs> because my <laughs> customers are, they are not acquainted to, to buy modern art made by uh, by an Arab, <laughs> frankly to say, you know. Very American to very be said American. <laughs> So <laughs> So she, she was very in, in, uh, involved with uh, the, the art milieu. She put my paintings in magazines, like there was a magazine called, I, I forgot the name, on, fa on, uh, on furniture and uh, design. And she put me in a very important show that took place in Washington Gal Gallery of Modern Art by the title of The Formalists. And among artists in that show, my work was there and next to Piet Mondrian. Because wow. through alphabetical order, my name comes <laughs> before Mondrian. <laughs> so you benefited from your... So anyway, this... Your Arab name. We, we, yeah, <laughs> in a way... <laughs> So the, the, the time start becoming closer and closer to so the, the period that in which I was supposed to, to leave the United States, go back to my country, because in the agreement I signed with the Rockefeller Foundation, there was a clause that says, whenever you finish your training in the United States, you go back to your Home country, country to make benefit your country from your experience. So at that time, in 1964, I was not like new immigrants today, what they call the brain fled. Every intelligent or capable person Leave. from the third world goes to Europe, to the advanced world, remains there. No, in my period, we rush all of us from France, from Spain, from Germany, from Russia, we rushed back to our country to help our country. And this is hist historic. Yeah. So I went to Morocco. Once in Morocco, the question was exposed to m in front of me. So you come to Morocco, you go to Morocco to, to teach art, but which kind of art are you going to teach those young people? Knowing that I've been trained in the Greco-Latin culture. Mm -hmm. And I am part of a culture that has nothing to do with Greco-Latin cultures. In some way, we have some, you know, historically speaking. 
So the thing was to make a course, a quick course, to show the students that, yes, you can draw from a fragment of plaster, you can draw nature, you can grow still life, but this is not in harmony with your own culture. Your own culture is different. You know, and the question here was very heavy question. Does Arab world, does Morocco has a type of art or not? This is a, I mean, I think it's, a, it's very interesting for me to think about the fact that you asked yourself that question, given that you were also positioned in a place like uh, Asila and Tangier, that it was always open to other cultures. You respectfully kind of uh, allowed, you know, yourself to engage with all these other cultures. You talk about the influence of American culture, French, Roman, um, all of this, the Arab, your own kind of uh, Berber uh, uh, heritage, and all of, and the African, of course. And you, uh, you're asking yourself, yet what defines uh, what defines uh, an Arab modernism f or an Arab kind of vocabulary of art um, or a specific Moroccan vocabulary of art. And I, I, I personally, um, I, I mean, I see it in your painting, but I want you to reflect on this a little bit, but I see forms that are trying to abridge all of these cultures. Thank you to bring this back. But before answering your question, I jumped a period and I jumped <laughs> a, an element which plays a big role in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm a Muslim educated through Islamic thoughts. Islam, anyway. So, but I was brought up and taught in non-Islamic countries. Mm -hmm. This is a very important element. So my journey in Europe, and I was looking after to be in the United States, there was a movement, there was something that young people start uh, looking for. The Europeans, they were a bit somehow fed up mm -hmm. of the liturgy of their own religion. You know. They were looking for something new. So. Eastern philosophy start, they start having space in the European mentality. That's Zen Buddhism in particular. You know, and also uh, we discover, for instance, when I was in Rome, there was a foundation that brought, brought a very important exhibition in Rome that's works are painting and drawings and uh, Aquarelle, water color, of Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore is a great Indian, Indian poet artist, yes. and artist, but he's not known as an artist. No. So the Europeans start thinking now oh, a philosopher does. Okay. Then there was a show about uh, Zen Buddhism art in Japan. And in one of the days my life in, in Rome, I knew a lady who used to have this foundation. She was an American by the name of Frances McCann. One day, she brought in her hand a small, a tiny book, black, and she put it in my hand like this. Read this. This was a book written by a German about the art of archery. He went to Japan to learn how to practice the art of the art according to the Zen education. To make the story short, this man used should, uh, should uh, request it to throw his arrow to the target in a dark room. Through his thinking, the way his thinking. So I discovered this philosophy and then I dropped my colors on one side and start working on black on black and making college, collage, the 
no any more dripping colors. Yeah? It's collage. You know, working in the sense of alif, vertical lines. Vertical There's a beautiful uh, example of that period of work, in particular in the booth <coughs> of uh, Lauri Shabibi. Uh, quite a beautiful and intact historic work uh, from 1959 um, uh, that is particularly from that period. So to finish this chapter, there, there was a book that just came out, made uh, written by Alan Watts, Buddhism, Buddhism Zen, Buddhism in California. Now, when you think of California at that period, you would discover writers like Jack Kerouac, like Berlinghetti, like Gregory Corso, all these poets, they were the 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 the, the, uh, the saints of the beat generation that was very important. And then when I was in America attending universities and colleges, all the youth they were impressed and reading Kumaraswami, a Indian philosopher. So This discovery <coughs> gave me a confidence mm -hmm. that Westerners, in advance in high technology and in high thinking, they read about Eastern philosophy and Eastern religions. So this made peace with me, mm -hmm. with my religion, Islam. I became reading about Zen. About Buddhism and all this, so it's a really uh, a chopped salad. <laughs> but <laughs> it depends and how you deal with it. <laughs> it's a, a very important and very complex and a, a lived experience of yeah. influences and philosophies and ideas, which make you the person you are. I'm interested now to your beginnings in Morocco. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming Good. to do yours. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, I, I'm keen. I, there are things to it because the, yes. the, the 60s, the, the, this decade was very important it's in, in all the world. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the decade of the Beatles, of the Rolling Stone, of uh, all the trends, of revolutions in Czechoslovakia, of a revolution in Cuba. You know, th the 60s are very important period in modern history. And we are all linked to it through information. Yes. There were no internet at that time, no Wi-Fi, no, uh, uh, you know, WhatsApp. And no satellites, yes. Other. Now, going back to our... So when we were taught Arabs, mostly Arabs and Muslims, in, w in the Western world, we go to art academies and they say, uh, Islamic art is decorative. The academy leaders, they always consider non-European art decorative. So, you see, oh, that's decorative. That's an attitude to, you know, to take off. So this trends, this social and popular expression, they were not considered as art expression. They were considered decorative. What that means, decorative? It's a form of art that doesn't give any spiritual preach or teaching to the people. Yeah. And now, modern art is giving the right to the decorative art. That's what we are doing now. If you see my paintings titled Mosharabiyyeh, in black, in green, in blue, are the response to what decorative art means in the field, in, th in the context of modernity. And as I said, you may have read it, that modernity is something that happens everywhere at any time. It doesn't, it shouldn't be just a, a message that comes from the West. You understand? So our research in the school of Casablanca was concentrated on Berber art, that on Moroccan art, 
what I, we mean by Berber, the Berbers are the population that existed in North Africa at the same time of Greece, Rome, Pharaonic, and Berbers have a connection with them. There are people who wrote that the Pharaoh started in North Africa, not even in North Africa. The Pharaoh, the Pharaoh origin is the, in Atlantid, that continent that has been swallowed by the ocean. <laughs> you see? So we, Morocco, we belong to Atlas, Atlas, the Atlantic Sea, and the Atlantid, the remote continent that has been emerged <coughs> in, in the ocean. And those who maybe history doesn't talk about that flood. It speaks thr through the Bible about Noah. Noah, you know that. It's in Christian and Jewish and this thing. But before the flood of Noah, there was a, an earlier flood, which is the Atlantid. And that's why <coughs> scholars are concentrating in on why you have pyramids in Mexico, in Guatemala, in Egypt, and in Mesopotamia. Similahi, we have 10 Time. more minutes, and I want I'm us to, to no, I really want us to talk about you know, a crucial period, which is when you return and you started to talk about some of your ideas, uh, coming back to Morocco, looking at the work of crafts and really starting to articulate a philosophy of bringing in all these, let's say, what are uh, looked at as uh, the low arts, uh, quote unquote, but really thinking about how you el elevate them into a modern language. Uh, you become part of the Ecole de Casablanca alongside uh, Farid Belkahia and many others. And uh, you take up on that role as an artist, a teacher, um, uh, and a provocateur. And I want you to talk about that experience at least for the next, uh, let's say, important 10 minutes that we have. Okay, well, uh, it's, uh, well th th that period, Casablanca period was a mixture of interest in art, in visual arts, and in pottery and literature field. Mm -hmm. And these two, these two uh, uh, schools or tendencies, mental tendencies, obliged us to take positions like, like political and social positions. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we used to have a sort of anger feeling to do things fast and strongly explained to 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 the young people, and uh, and you were effective. Well, it it history that will s say, you know. So it was not to ban all forms of art. No, is to to make a link and the bridge between what could what the layman has produced as art in the utilitarian object, you know, fabrics, metalwork, jewelry, woodwork, wood cutting. Ceramics, yes. Ceramics, very important. So all these arts that have been applied for population's sake to, to make order in their life and look, for instance, if you go to, to the Louvre Museum here, you might find a lot of art is utilitarian art. It's not the painting. It's, it's not the glorified form of art. You see pots, you see fabrics, you see ustensils, metal ustensils, and that's art. And modernity comes from there. So what we are doing, this is my my personal endeavor now is to put decorative art at the top. And this is my work. That's a very <laughs> great summary. And I also wanted to ask you in particular of um, what we see here in the image, which is uh, that, that 
particular exhibition you did in Jama Lifna and the rationale behind that that particular exhibition why why basically show your paintings in such a public forum what are the ideas behind that that's a start of a, of an action of demystification of the factor art we painted pieces with no sign no no prices hang in a very low public place where everybody can watch these pieces of art hang for 10 days under sun wind and rain so this is to show people that art is an idea more than an object you see this is very important and then the action was against the government because the government they wanted to open a saloon of art gathering artists who what they call in French les peintres du dimanche Sunday painters <laughs> you know no no we we we've done that action to show that art is also thinking is also science is also in in social interest to communicate with the population that was like a, it's an historical date that marks the start of how we can deal with art today it's a very democratic act and i think one of the most uh i would dare say uh at that time for me and this is something i even used emblematically when I was curating the Marrakesh Biennial, it really is that moment of thinking, how public could I be for my art? How connected do, am I with my people? How connected am I with uh, uh, my society? It's a very radical gesture. Um, and it's really in op opposition to a lot of the canonical, modern uh, ideas that are about isolation, the white cube, uh, safekeeping objects, not people per se, and I think that's something uh, really very. It's a very in, like deep action, and ve as I said, very democratic. Um, I want you uh, to also. Uh, you're an activist and a politician, and um, your painting. Um, I'm someone who's very. Uh, uh, you know, I was very humbled to understand and study the flame that you have arrived at from your geometric period into this kind of curvature of line. Can you speak a little bit about that, at least? Uh, what does that flame, what does the curve represent to you? Um, and give us a little bit of your political background as well and uh, for the audiences to know who you Thank really you. are. <laughs> well, uh, to start with the political action, let's see, I, I take you back to my hometown, which is Asila. 1978 we have started the festival but our action in that little town was just to use art because we wanted to show our population in morocco educated and layman is that art it's not a genuine object that you hang somewhere in your room or your place no art is a tool could make a revolution, could render people aware about what ideas you can bring out from an artistic action. So we have a little town, economically very low, because as I mentioned that after independence in Morocco, all the power, economical and technical power, went to the big the capital because the Europeans, they always played that you, don't, you shouldn't have your independence because you are not able to carry on your responsibilities. We are the people who know how to do things, so you have to, to follow our orders and obey and remain main minor. So these places were abandoned up when the Europeans left. So our hometown was in, in, in decline, in the fall, so we said we ran for elections and we won the election we said when you win elections in 
in political activism, you discovered that you were dreaming. I'm not saying that you were lying to people to vote for you. You discovered the reality. You discovered that you cannot do what you have been proposing in your campaigning. Like in America now, <laughs> presidents campaign, but sometimes they don't accomplish what they have promised. Anyway, we, we started in painting in each street, in each neighborhood, uh, an important artist, Bezgaya, Shiba, Hamidi, uh, several, we were a bunch of us, and we painted murals in the neighborhood and bringing kids, girls and boys to work with us because they were our mean of communication to their parents to stop them through garbage in the street. Mm -hmm. So make the city clean first. And this has been really a gesture that never, never in the world that painting was used as a social and uh, encouraging mean to stop uh, people doing in quotation, bad things. So people became aware of environment. They painted their houses and they began. If you go to Asila now, it's a very clean bone. It's a beautiful city. It, it has, city. it has. So then we, st we said it's not only to paint streets, we should bring people from the world, from the Arab world mainly to speak to our population in the summer, because Asila is 30,000 people mm -hmm. normally, but in the summer it's 200,000 people. All the people from the inside the country, they come for to bathe in the, on the shore. So we organized the festival and the sort of summer university, we brought Mahmoud Darwish from Palestine, uh, art, uh, and, and I mean, I forgot the names because we have a piles of people, hundreds of scholars stop in Asila, spend in Asila. I spoke to the population in Asila. You Sibu see, and this, this was the, As I'm sorry, the Asila period. Anyway. The f just answer the flame, what ah, it represents. Yes, the flame, yeah, you, and you then we're yeah. going to open it to yeah, yeah. questions and As, yeah. uh, No, answer. the flame. So it, 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 this is, you, li you, you, you take it or not. Mm -hmm. There has been a problem. There is a problem that the Arab, Arab world has, has, has been affected by the sort of disease. Disease. Now, it's not, not, not uh, to kill. It doesn't kill, but it make you live. This is the contradictory of disease. Is the Arab-Israeli problem has affected all the Arab population in the world throughout 70 or 80 years, you see? So we became all concerned of what, is ha what it happens in the Holy Land. So my waves, who were waves of water in Africa, my waves were uh, a symbol of a dance, sensual graphism and so on has become like an alphabetical language for my work then I've decided to to make a painting or a design or a graphic design about Palestine and that flame is a symbol of the Palestinian revolution that's it um, uh and uh, I, I do want to open the floor for some questions uh, from the audience. I'm sure some people would like to ask you directly, not just myself. First question. Is there a mic? There's a mic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your work, and I've been reading a lot of uh, articles about your work. And I'm just curious, you just said that you put decorative art on the top of your like a realm of art, but at the same time, you consider art as a tool to governize people or citizens into action. Kind of, um, if, we, if we think that decorative art does not contain much meaning or like political potentials, I just wonder how these two ideas harmonize each other. Yes. Can you help me? Um, better. Yeah. So she's asking basically, um, how decorative art and 
like art as a tool to uh, make people act. How do decorative arts and uh, art as a tool of like politics as well help make people act? How do you reconcile I'm sorry. that? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. No, uh, uh, any type of art. You see, if you put it in the level of uh, a way of communication and a way of awakening, you know, minds and attitudes, that art could be could help, could broad broad minds of people, you know, and. Actually, we, we live with art. In other words, when you go to, to, to buy your sweater, you choose the color, you choose the, the shape. You might use a garment who has an inscription. It's, it's, it's an artistic thing. So we use art as a way of living daily, and we don't realize that. And, and actually, you get me? Yeah, and can I, I, I also have my own interpretation as someone who is a curator and uh, someone who is actively trying to um, uh, build that kind of art history of our in our region and this kind of influence. And I have my conclusions, okay. which is the art that we see today from contemporary artists that is very active, socially engaged, finds its premises in this. These are the beginnings of, you know, that kind of radical rupture in modern art becoming more integrated into society yeah. and interventionist. And all our contemporary artists today owe their dues and influences from such moments. Yeah, I can give so you the last image. We, are, we, are, uh, we assist today in the revolution in the world. There are many in Latin America, but Hong Kong, yes. the people in Hong Kong, they protest with umbrellas. And those kind of umbrellas, when you look at them, how they are with several and different colors, there is an artistic act. You don't notice it, but if you look, if you look at it, there are moving paintings. You are not in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is 7,000 kilometers away. But it gives you an idea that using different colored umbrellas can play a role even for their sake, for their, their objective is to protest, is to say no, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and just to the importance of your question in relation to thinking about the decorative arts and where that, so uh, what I understood the Casablanca School and specifically uh, Simelehi's uh, uh, input was an emancipation of hierarchy. Oh, okay, yeah. this is it. There is no hierarchy in that. And in that understanding, you already open a lot for caveats of society, right? Because there is a structural, there is a structurally hierarchical problematic. And it's symptomatic of society. Yeah. In, in, in a symbolic act to say, no, we break down those barriers of what are our influences where are we seen as, where our arts are seen as backward or, you know, inferior or lower? You eradicate all of these barriers to reclaim your voice, one, and eradicate all of these structural um, uh, oppositions. Yeah. And that's an emancipation. It's a, a, it's, a, it's a project of emancipation. It's extremely important. It's indicative. You take the forms, the visual forms, as a format, like you take any language. So you start to deconstruct the first essence, which is the visual language, that is already stratified. Yes. And I think that's where it's really kind of important. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, we have a question here in the front. Uh, have the last slide. Um, this thank is you. unfortunately the last question. Oh, sorry, I hope it's a good one. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I think um, Arim, you mentioned stuff that I wanted to ask about in the sense of this emancipation you're talking about um, and whether that exists. Have we been emancipated in terms of, uh, you know, Arab art, African art, Middle Eastern art? Do we still, are we still playing into what the Western narrative is of what art is? Um, are we free from that yet? Um, let uh, Similia answer. Well, 
I I I I hope I I I got your 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 question and idea. It's today we are assist, we assist to a new a new revolution in art. In other words, uh, Arab artists and Arab production artistic production starts breaking for borders. It, it's. It is an ambiguous situation. We are we don't expect the recognition from the West, but our art should go to the West. The Western world, Western world should know that art is universal. It's not regional. You see, this is very important. If um, artists today can show in America, in Germany, participate in fairs, this is. An, an advance, so we are advancing, we are showing others that we can participate in this, in the same thinking, you see, and we, th their art could well, we were expecting this, for, you know, my 10 years out of my country in Europe, but in America, I was always considered like an outsider. Um, I you know, in the side. But I broke that said because historically I've been in important places like MoMA, uh, in Rio and in Washington. But I, it's me. But now it's this activity becomes more and more. In other words, Westerners are becoming more peaceful to understand and to accept some other people's thinking and some other people's situation. I wonder if I, if I give you my answer. I think it's important to remember the moments such as the artists and the Casablanca School as emblematic of independent thinking, um, knowledgeable of everything around them that is happening in the world, yet concertedly trying to do independent thinking and production for their own ecology and ideas and their own societies. This is the fact of our art historical kind of presence all across the Arab world and the global south, um, everywhere, from uh, artists in India in the 50s to, uh, you know, to artists in Palestine in the, in this, also in the 70s and 80s. Um, and elsewhere, there are always their own particularities. It was not always about, um, uh, it, it's always a con conversation of references and cultural references. We do things for our, own, uh, for our own constituents and for our own particular cultural particulars. So this is something I firmly believe in. Um, how does that figure largely um, in, you know, uh, in kind of the narration in museums uh, and everything, we are starting to see a very clear, um, also concerted effort, even from museums all over the world, to revise that history and to tell it as it is. It's m far more complex and it's not just Euro-American centric. And that's something that is absolutely necessary. I do think that uh, the fact that we uh, are still yet to build our uh, patronage and our markets to support our artistic practice. This is something that will help kind of uh, inst you know, reinstate these positions moving onwards. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank Mr. Mohamed Milehi for his valuable time. Uh, uh, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>